This is a pile of interesting camcorders, and this is a hat because I got a COVID haircut. That's when you really badly need a haircut, but you can't go out, so your girlfriend gives you one. Hence the hat. I'm gonna talk for about 20 minutes about why these are interesting, and then I'll show them to you. The history of camcorders is fascinating because of how many technologies have come and gone as manufacturers tried to keep up with a rapidly changing world, largely unnoticed and unremembered. There were market battles like the beta versus VHS wars that went on long after the 80s that most people don't know about because the manufacturers were trying to answer questions that most people don't remember asking. The result of this, as many other YouTubers can attest, was a lot of failed video formats. When people think about old camcorders, they tend to think about videotape. And of course, videotape was around for a long time, but it's been gone for a really long time too. If you're like me, you probably spent most of your life not thinking about the question, what came between videotape and now? Videotape started out as pure analog television signals recorded on the tape. This here is a VHSC cartridge. That's exactly what was stored on it. The actual magnetic signal that was laid down on this tape was just a normal television signal just encoded into a magnetic form. There were countless inconveniences with the very early tape formats, but the primary upshot of them is that you could shoot this in your camcorder, then take it home and just slam and jam it into your VCR and hit play and see it right there on your TV. This was magic in the mid 80s, and it's largely the only thing people really had to do with videotape. There were no computers, no internet, no easy way to edit video. You could do it if you bought multiple recorders and were a hyper nerd that was willing to spend just eons dicking around with them to make it happen, but almost nobody did it. All the people that are watching that did it are gonna comment, it's okay, I respect you, you're awesome, you were very rare. This was okay for about 12 to 15 years, and then people got a lot more ambitious. Namely, they got computers, and suddenly there were a lot of new things you could do with video. Uh, you could email a clip to a friend. You could edit video in iMovie or Windows Movie Maker. You could produce highlight reels of your kid's soccer game that nobody was going to watch. Uh, I'm so excited about this. You know how easy it is to take your home videos and turn them into movies? Listen to this, you get an iMac, of course, get your digital video camera, hook it up, and start iMovie. They've got effects in there now. You can, um, you know, make it real fast. Ooh. Or get slow motion, make it dramatic. Or you can take a piece of music, put it under your footage, and all of a sudden, people are laughing, crying. I don't know, whatever you want. I've got cheesy ideas, but you'll do something creative that'll make you want to go, ooh, let's watch that again and again and again and again. To do this, you had to get the video into your computer somehow. Methods for importing video into your computer are so old that they predate USB. This thing here, the Dazzle, is from the mid-90s, and you can put composite video into it, and then it connects to your parallel port to allow you to import it to your computer. And it was terrible, but people were so hungry for something to do with video on their computers that these things did in fact sell, otherwise I wouldn't have one. These got better, but they never got great because analog video doesn't want to become digital. You had to sit there and babysit the entire process. There were lots of things that could go wrong and analog video already looked like crap. So putting it through a digital conversion didn't help matters. There were plenty of other downsides to analog tape. And as the world digitized everything, video was gonna have to follow. And sure enough, it did. In the late 90s, camcorders started switching to mini DV. This is a mini DV camera from the late 90s. And this is its tape. This little tape stores about 60 minutes of digital video and you can copy it onto your computer losslessly. Let me show you what that looks like. The video you're watching right now has been digital its entire life. I copied it onto my computer over Firewire with no loss of quality. The video was recorded onto tape using a lossy codec called the DV codec, but once I copy it from the tape to my PC, nothing is lost in the process. And then I can move that video around as many times as I want, copy it onto other tapes, etc., and it never degrades. That's very cool, but these still sucked because tape sucks. Magnetic tape is miserable for one really big reason. It is a linear access medium, meaning that if you want to get from one spot on the tape to another spot on the tape, the only way to do it is to turn the spindles. And the tape moves from one spindle to the other spindle, and you wait. You can spin it faster, but there's only so fast you can go, and there's only so much accuracy you can have. You just have to wait while you spin the spindles until you get to the place you're going. The mini DV mechanism is a wonder of engineering and digitizing the video sure helps the experience be less irritating, but the user experience improvement from VHS-C in 1984 to mini DV in 1996 was not really all that much. Consider this scenario. 
you're at a party with your camcorder. You're shooting video at the party, which is gonna be super cool later. This probably isn't true, but almost everyone thinks it is when they buy a camcorder. So after shooting for half an hour, you go outside to have a smoke, and while you're out there, you decide you wanna review your video. See what you got. So you turn your camera on, and you press play. Well, there's nothing there, because the video is behind you, so you have to rewind. So you rewind, and you rewind, and you rewind, and you rewind. And you stand there for two and a half minutes, and you rewind, because there's no quicker way to get where you're going. The whole time you're rewinding, you're looking at the screen. You can't look away, because the only way to know whether you've gotten to the moment you're looking for is to watch the screen. The screen is full of shredded video compression artifacts, because the mechanism in the camera can only read the tape reliably at one speed, and you're going faster than that. So you're looking at this shredded digital image, trying to find the moment you're looking for, for two and a half minutes. It takes you a few tries to get it right, but finally you find the moment and you hit play and you start watching your video. And it takes four seconds for it to start playing and then another four seconds for the audio to start coming out. Then as you're watching your video, someone's car catches fire and you want video of it, but you can't because you destroy your party footage. So you have to fast forward for two and a half minutes. And then by the time you're finally at the blank part of the tape where you can safely record a new video, the event is over. Later you get home and you wanna watch this video. Well, you don't have a mini DV deck under your TV, so you can't just put it in there. Uh, they did make them, I think, but nobody bought them. You could plug it into the TV, but you don't know where the weird cable that it takes is. You can, however, plug it into your computer. Firewire cable is an easy thing to keep track of, and hey, it's, you know, 2000. Everybody's got a Firewire cable if they're a video dork, right? So you can go and plug it into your iMac G3. So now you can go to your PC and start iMovie and hit record, and then hit play on the camera, and then wait because you shot an hour of footage and it's gonna take an hour to copy it to the computer because the tape mechanism can only read reliably at one speed. The clip you wanna see is only about 30 seconds long, but it's in the middle of the footage and you don't know where. So you're just going to have to press rewind and wait for 15 minutes as you stare at shredded video artifacts. Or you could go to bed and do it in the morning. Nowadays, cameras shoot video on flashcards, like this Canon Vixia here that I shot my early YouTube videos on. It takes an SD card, you press record, it starts recording until the card is full, or you press stop. If you want to see what you've already recorded, you can press the play button, and it'll show you a grid of thumbnails, every video that you've shot on this card. You can tap on one to see that video, and if something happens while you're watching it, you can just press the record button again, and the camera's ready to record immediately. There's no fast forwarding. I shot dozens of hours of footage on this thing, and I never once thought about the storage medium, other than to ask the question, is it full? At the end of the day, you take the card out of the camera, you put it in your PC, there's a bunch of files. One file for every time you hit record. You drag them off onto your PC and that's it. This is a massive leap forward from videotape, of course, and it's possible because the camera uses a flash card and flash cards are random access. Random access means any point on the card is as quick to get to as any other point on the card. It doesn't take a linear amount of time. The distance between two points is irrelevant. It can jump from here to here to here to here at exactly the same speed. This is why when I press the play button, it's able to rapidly build thumbnails of all the videos. It's jumping through and grabbing the first frame out of each one because that doesn't cost anything on a random access medium. This is also why I can instantly start recording, because it knows in memory at all times where the blank space on the card is. So when I hit the record button, it just zips straight there. This camera is essentially perfect. You can make improvements to the optics, you can make improvements to the codec, but there's nothing you can do to the recording mechanism to improve it. It's done, it's finished. It could not be better. The problem is that solid state storage was really expensive for a very long time. I used to shoot with a 32 gig flash card in here and those were not available at all until like the 2010s. And even then they were fantastically expensive for quite some time. Even so, that 32 gig card could only hold a couple hours of video because video is enormous. Digital video is one of the great drive fillers. If you ask me, I figure that about 40% of the multi-terabyte hard drives in the world are full of video files right now. Hollywood footage, DVR recordings, hell, I guess everybody else is just storing stolen movies and porn, so I guess really hard drives are just for storing video. I don't know what else you'd do with them. Digital video was taking up tons of space even when it was new. The bit rate of mini-DV in 1996 was 25 megabits. Now, codecs have gotten better over the years, so we can store a lot more in the same space, but 25 megabits is about what this camera is recording at right now. If you do the math, at 25 megabits per second, times 60 minutes, times 60 seconds, this little tiny tape stores about 11 to 12 gigabytes of data. In 1996, 
There was no consumer media in existence at that time that could store that much data. Maybe a hard drive. But this thing was able to do that in this little tiny package, which you can beat the hell out of, unlike a hard drive. You're gonna need that again. There were, however, no 11 gigabyte flash cards or eight gigabyte flash cards or, or two gigabyte flash cards. There was nothing on that scale in solid state storage. So mini DV offered advantages over analog video for sure, but its limitations still ranged from irritating to intolerable depending on your profession. Everyone was looking for something better. The pros were looking for something better. The consumers were looking for something better. There was room in the market for innovation. In the early 2000s, camcorder manufacturers were looking for a next evolutionary step, something to get camcorders past what they'd perfected with many DV into something more accessible, more convenient, and something that fit the digital age better. Besides that, I think they were really peeved by where they'd been for a long time regarding playback. Like I said earlier, in the early days of home video, you shot video on your VHS camcorder, and then you took it home and put it straight into your VCR. Even these little tapes you could do that with. Uh, there were adapters you could put them in. They would adapt them to fit in a normal VCR. So there was a direct workflow. You take it out of the camera, you put it into the TV pretty much. By the 2000s, that was pretty much a memory. Nobody had been able to do that with a new camcorder in a very long time. VHS had been off the market, I believe, for quite a bit, and all the formats that had come after it, 8mm, Hi8, Mini DV, etc., there weren't really any consumer players for them. I mean, I, I think they did exist, but no one had one. Now, you could plug your Mini DV camcorder into your TV directly. It's got an AV jack on there that adapts out to plug into the RCA jacks on your TV. But that's really irritating because now instead of having a comfortable time watching a tape, you're sitting here like this with a cable dangling out of your camcorder, running the battery down and having to press these little buttons instead of using a remote. Who wants to do that? I think that in the early 2000s, the camcorder manufacturers really wanted to get back to a world where your camcorder shot on the same media that your rented movies came on. Well, in the early 2000s, if you were looking for a medium that was high density, portable, affordable, durable, and worked in the equipment that consumers already had, the choice was clear. Optical media was going to be the solution. CDs and then DVDs and eventually Blu-rays were the highest density storage available to consumers for quite some time, like probably through most of the 2000s. Prior to the development of flash drives, these were really the best way for a consumer to move large amounts of data. In addition, DVDs and Blu-rays were both designed as video formats for home video rental, which meant everybody was buying players that plugged into their TVs. Optical media was the data and video format of the 2000s. It makes perfect sense that camcorders would be designed that took it, and that's exactly what all these do. I have a variety here. I've been collecting them for some time. Uh, I wasn't able to get every single one that I wanted, but the ones I wasn't able to get were either prototypes that never really hit production or like one-offs or fiendishly expensive, or they're all broken. Uh, these ones at least all work. That is a lie. The type that would have been most common for sure would be the DVD camcorders. Uh, these are those, I've got three of them. These record not onto full-size disc. That would be pretty wild. These record onto eight centimeter DVDs. Uh, you might know these by the term mini DVD, although I'm not sure that was ever a standard term. Uh, and these get about 1.4 gigs uh, per side. They did make dual side and, and dual layer ones eventually. Despite their size, these are generally compatible with most equipment. Uh, CD players, DVD players, and Blu-ray players were virtually all designed so they could take eight centimeter discs. Uh, in addition, if you put the right files on here, you could make video that would play in a DVD player. There were tons of DVD cameras uh, throughout the 2000s, uh, all the way up to about 2010. Uh, the oldest one I have here is 2003, I have a 2004, and then this is a 2010 model. It has a piece of tape over the side, so you don't get a very late part of the story very early. Now you'll notice one thing about these very quickly, which is that they all betray their media, which is to say uh, you'd never be fooled into thinking that these don't take discs. Discs don't weigh very much and they aren't very thick, but they are very large in diameter. So it's kind of unavoidable that they're going to protrude from the palm-sized camcorders that were popular at the time. What's funny about this though, is that these are actually fairly conventional designs compared to what could have happened. See, there's this phenomenon with camcorders going back to the early 80s. Every time the media shrinks, the camcorder manufacturers go, hey, does the camcorder need to be shaped that way anymore? Well, the trouble is, it was shaped around the medium, and that happened to be really convenient for the human hand. <laughs> it turns out that uh, human hands are pretty good at grasping things that are like this. So yes, camcorders do need to keep being camcorder shaped. That's why my little SD card one here is uh, 
pretty much the same as these and really pretty much the same as everything going back forever. It's a box or a tube with a grip on the side of it. Well, that doesn't mean they haven't tried though. Uh, attempts like the vertical Hitachi tube camera in the mid 80s, uh, the JVC cigarette pack that started the mini DV form factor, uh, the sharp view cam, uh, the flip, uh, the whole genre of action cameras, uh, and then this thing, the Sony DCR DVD7, which is basically a CD Walkman that you can shoot video on for some reason. See, this device swings the opposite direction entirely. It says, hey, instead of trying to make the camera not about its format, let's make it entirely about its format. Let's have it scream. Hi, there's a disc inside of me. I struggled to not buy one of these on eBay. I really wanted to, but I did resist it because I'm sure it sucks. PC Magazine's review of it said, what do I have here? The camera was cool and hip, but not so practical for actual use, which is perhaps the most crushing criticism of 2000s industrial design that I've ever heard. But the point is that all these cameras are basically ordinary looking except for the hump on the side for the disc. I wanna start with the media handling. So I'm actually gonna start with the 2010 one because uh, as interesting as the old ones are, this one is actually more representative of how most DVD camcorders handled their media. It's a really nice looking camera. Uh, I found out long after I bought it that it was probably really expensive. So it's well designed, it feels good in the hand, all the controls are nicely placed. It's a pretty good camera. By 2010, we'd really figured out how to make camcorders. I mean, there's honestly very little difference between these two, except that this one has to be a little taller to accommodate the medium. This one's media handling is very straightforward. Uh, if I pull the switch here, you have to wait for the camera to open the door, just like you did with most videotape camcorders. All right, and then we have a completely conventional Walkman style CD spindle. Take the disc here, just put it in there press and that's it and we're ready to shoot it does take a few seconds after you put the disc in well it figures out what type of disc it is checks to see if there's a file system on it and whatnot and if this disc isn't formatted uh, we do have to format it that takes 10 seconds or so it actually has a little wizard that it walks you through so you could decide how you want to format it because there's a couple different ways to record on these but we'll talk about that later We'll look at how shooting works uh, in a couple minutes, but first, let's talk about the disc mechanisms in the other two devices. Like I said, this one's very conventional. The way these ones handle their discs is not so conventional. Actually, pretty wild. This one here is the Hitachi DZ MV230A. Uh, it's from 2003. It's actually kind of a late model, technically. Hitachi made the uh, first one back in 2000, and I wanted to get one of those. That was the MV100, but there weren't any on eBay. I've been searching for eons. This one's also DVD-based, but if you saw it from a distance, you might not think that. You might think it takes a floppy or mini disc or something like that. Well, it doesn't take floppy, it doesn't take mini disc, it doesn't quite take DVD either. Let me show you what it takes. This one's so old it actually has a mechanical eject. Yeah, baby. Anyway, what's in here is one of these. It's not mini disc, don't get your hopes up. Uh, this is a ordinary DVD-R, but it's inside of a carrier that Hitachi refers to as square holder. It completely encapsulates the disc, you can't touch it anywhere, and when you put it into the camera, it slides this shutter to the side just like a floppy disk. It's easy to use, just put it in there, close the door. But it is weird. Look at this, you go, why am I being saddled with this? What, what's, what's this thing about? How do I get disks in that form? What? There is an explanation for this. It just takes some context. Let's talk about disk caddies. Optical disk manufacturers have always believed, for some reason, that data disks will not survive being scratched. Anyone who grew up in the PlayStation era knows this is not true. Children are machines for demolishing CDs, and despite the horrifying abuse that we put all of our discs through, they still read just fine for the most part. If you wanna make a CD stop reading, you pretty much have to put it on some sharp rocks and then jump on it. If you go through the history of optical media, however, you find that the people who design discs have always been trying to get them saddled with these exoskeletons. An early example was Magneto Optical, an 80s technology that was very cool, but which most consumers never saw. It stored about 200 odd megabytes in a CD format that was uh, fully rewritable, so you could treat it pretty much like a flash drive. Like I said, it was very cool, it was just expensive. It came in a plastic case that looked pretty much like this one. It was larger, but it served the same purpose and had pretty much all the same components. It had the sliding metal cover so that you couldn't fingerprint the disc or scratch it. 
Now I can believe this was necessary for Magneto Optical, which was a very early rewritable format. Maybe it was super fragile. But I guess the designers liked it so much they just kept trying to do it. So in the 80s and 90s, computer CD-ROMs didn't have the slide-out drawers that we're used to now. Instead, they required the use of CD Caddy, a thing that looked just like this, or Magneto Optical. The purpose would appear to be to protect the disc, the same way the case for Magneto Optical did. This is kind of wild though, because discs didn't come in these. They came in normal jewel cases, and you were expected to buy your own caddies, and the only way you'd get any of the protective benefits is if you kept the discs in the caddies 24-7. But the discs came with jewel cases, and the caddies aren't labeled. So now you've got all your discs on a shelf above your PC, you can't tell which one's which, and then somewhere else you've got this whole row of jewel cases that are empty, or you have to throw them away. And on top of that, I've read that these CD caddies cost double digits in the early 90s. So you were adding like 20% to the cost of all your software by buying these. No one was going to do that. And from what I've heard, very few people did. It's really wild actually, because this could have been super cool if they just worked with software manufacturers to ship CD caddy compatible liners with every program. You could put those in the caddy so you'd have a label. You wouldn't have to keep the jewel case, but they didn't do that. So the whole thing was just useless and irritating. They were in fact counterproductive because what people did instead is buy an caddy and then swap discs in and out of it out of normal jewel cases, meaning you were handling the discs more and you were fumbling them more. So if anything, this made the situation worse. Then at some point, Mitsumi put out a drive that took discs in a normal drawer, everybody switched, nobody ever looked back, and thank God. So the CD caddy came and went for nebulous reasons, but the concept of the caddy itself kept coming back, although to be fair, every other variant of it made more sense. For instance, Denon sold an incompatible product that looked just like CD Caddy called CD Cart. This was for radio stations though. DJs beat the hell out of their discs and the radio stations could afford to buy one cart per disc. That way they don't have to spend the money on replacing the discs. So this made perfect sense. I've talked to people who worked in radio stations and used these and loved them. In the late 90s, there was also Sony Mini Disc, which looked exactly like this. And that was meant to be portable. So it really needed the extra durability. It was also permanently installed in the case. You couldn't take it out so it was fully protected just like Magneto Optical. Caddy also came back in the 2000s for the UMD used in the Sony PSP and it showed up a couple other places and it'll pop up again later in this video. So it's an optical storage meme, it just keeps coming back. And here's how it's relevant to our camcorder. When the original DVD format was released there was an accompanying kind of sister format called DVD-RAM. This is kind of tertiary to the consumer applications of these camcorders. Uh, I'm going to talk about it later. But the important thing is Hitachi wanted their camcorders to take DVD-RAM. Well, the early DVD-RAM discs came in caddies like this that were sealed, just like Magneto Optical. So if Hitachi wanted to be able to take this kind of disc, then they had to make every other kind of disc look like this. The solution was you could buy square holders. This here is an ordinary DVD-R which I've loaded into this plastic caddy using these obnoxious plastic fingers that barely hold the disc. It is really janky. You can see how loosely it's holding the disc there. And at any moment, this could fall out and, and, and roll off the table and get destroyed. And you have to do this all the time because yes, this lets you get into the camcorder, but then when you're done recording, to get it into a computer or a DVD player, none of which took these things, you're gonna have to do this in reverse to get it back out. So just like CD Caddy, this is making you constantly have to handle your bare discs in a really awkward way because every time you touch this thing, you've got to figure out how these little fingers work and you can really easily cross thread it and, and the disc will just fall out. So really this is just a way to drop your disc and scratch it, but Hitachi had banked on the DVD RAM format for some reason, so you were forced to do this. Ah! Damn it, I just did it. I just dropped it trying to put it back into the case and I've done this dozens of times. And now there's no way to get it out except that, ugh, this sucks, man. Now you could buy equipment that would take these in the caddies. Uh, you could get uh, certain DVD recorders. You could get uh, PC DVD drives that accepted them. But that was mostly for professionals and enthusiasts. The average individual was not going to have one of those. And that meant that after you recorded your video, every single time you were going to have to carefully pop this open and take the disc out and fingerprint it and scratch it as you get it back into its original jewel case. So the Caddy is a pain in the ass. It obviously adds extra expense, probably confused the hell out of a lot of consumers. It wasn't compatible with many other consumer devices and it's ultimately counterproductive. That said, there is an advantage if you wanted to spend some extra time and money. Uh, if you bought a bunch of bare DVD-Rs and a bunch of holders, uh, you could go home and load them all up and then throw them all in your bag. And then when you're out in the field, you can just grab one out of the bag. You don't have to worry about touching it. You don't have to get it out of the jewel case and just slam it into the camera. Also, there's a write protect switches on here. There's a one here and 
one there because it's a dual-sided carrier. And that's something that discs never had, a method for rate protecting them. So if you were uh, like a professional or a high-end amateur, I guess, uh, there were some cool things about this, but for most people, utterly pointless. As far as I can tell, nobody but Hitachi bothered with this. Everybody else just used plain spindles, like in this thing. And after a couple years, Hitachi stopped doing it too, probably because DVD-RAM stopped coming in permanent caddies. So the whole thing became pointless. What they switched to next, however, was even more baffling and harder to explain. In 2004, they put out this guy here. And this is the DZ-MV580A. This one does not take square holder. This one takes round holder. This is round holder. I was baffled by square holder until I understood the DVD RAM factor and then it all made sense. Round holder I don't get at all. It's two very thin pieces of plastic that flex so that you feel like you could scratch the disc by just squeezing it, which might be true. It doesn't really cover very much of the disc surface. And to get it open, you have to squeeze these two invisible latches here. And try as I might, I can't make it reliable. Every time I try to do this, I end up I just almost snapped it in half. Have I made my point? It's so flimsy. It doesn't cover anything. What's this for? It doesn't even have the right protect switch. And it's, uh, it's hard to explain why, but it's actually tougher to handle this than a bare disc. Like with a bare disc, you just feel like you know exactly where to put your hands. But with this one, it feels like you're gonna fingerprint it at any moment. And while handling these, I have done so, and I can't even explain why. Your fingers are just attracted to this open space here. The only thing this really seems to accomplish is to make it harder to load the camera. You know how when you put a disc in something, it doesn't matter which orientation you put it in? Well, with this it does. There's only one direction this can go into the camera. Is it that way? No, you'll destroy the disc. Is it that way? No, it won't go in. No, the only way to put this in is like that. And there's no arrow to tell you that that's the orientation, or if there is, it's really hard to see. Additionally, uh, square holder discs came in jewel cases. Uh, see this guy here? If I open this up, it actually has a DVD RAM in there in the square holder. This meant that you could load a whole bunch of these up and then put them in the jewel cases and then throw them in your bag. You can't do that with round holder because as far as I can tell, there weren't any jewel cases for it. So you can't load these up at home and take them with you. You have to take one round holder with you and then a bunch of discs and jewel cases. And then you have to balance all this mess on your knee in public, in the field, in the rain, and open this up and carefully extract the one disc and put in the other. This sucks, man. Square holder has an excuse and a purpose. Round holder has neither. And a year later, Hitachi stopped using them. I can't figure out why they ever did. All right, so putting Hitachi's bizarre adventure with carriers aside, all three of these cameras are very simple to use. You turn them on and you press record. This is the MV230A. It's not incredible or terrible. It looks like a home movie shot on DVD. This is the MV580A. The footage is not incredible or terrible. It looks like a home movie shot on DVD. And this is the 2010 camera. I'll give you its model number later. It's a secret for now. It doesn't look incredible or terrible. Looks like a home movie being shot on DVD. Although it is widescreen while the other ones were not. It's actually using the exact same number of pixels, 720 by 480. It's just stretching them horizontally so it uses a 16-9 aspect ratio when you play it back. This is actually how all widescreen DVDs worked. The picture from each camera looks about the same as what you'd get from a good mini DV camcorder. The one from this one might look a little better because it's so much newer than the others, but it's still just DVD. The controls on all of them are arguably about the same. The newer one just uses a touchscreen while the other two use little joysticks for navigation. Overall, the features, the options you can choose are pretty much the same as any other camcorder from this era. You've got your zoom, you've got your exposure, you've got your backlight compensation. Uh, this one here is new enough that it's got a night shot and it's got image stabilization, but really the only thing missing from any other contemporary camcorder are all the silly digital video effects, the sepia tone, the mosaic. Uh, but I think that stuff was falling out of popularity at that time anyway, so these are pretty much bog standard for 2000. Now, just in case you noticed in a close-up, these do have flashcard slots. This one has an SD card holder right here, but these aren't for recording video. These are actually for recording still photos. The thing that turbo nerds like me never notice about these because we have a purpose-built device for every single thing we do in our lives uh, is that most camcorders starting in like 2000, actually a few going back even further, have a still photo button. This mini DV camera has it and I have no real idea why. On this one, pressing the button just records like four seconds of a still image. 
I don't get it. I don't know what the purpose of that is. With these, however, it makes quite a bit more sense. I was informed that the sensors in these cameras are actually higher resolution than they need for video. So even though they do standard def, they're doing like a pixel binning in order to get better noise. So if you press the uh, photo button on one of these cameras, it will take a photo at the full actual resolution of the sensor and save it to the SD card. It doesn't look incredible, but it looks better than you'd expect. So I could take a selfie. Probably looks awful. But the wild thing about this is that since these predate decent ultra bright LEDs, they actually have xenon flash tubes on the front of them. The, uh, the 2000s were an incredible time to be alive. After you finish shooting, you start getting into the stuff that the disc medium actually enables. So I can go to playback mode here and there's almost immediately a grid of thumbnails of all the clips I've shot on this disc. Just uh, selecting one, I can start playing it right away. And then if something happens in the middle of it, I can just bail out of that mode, hit record, and instantly we're recording again. There are slight delays. The uh, laser head and optical drive can't move instantaneously. Uh, it has to seek from here to here. A hard drive would be faster, but it's so minimal that you really don't mind. Um, with these guys, I haven't really been in a situation yet where I hit the record button and it wasn't ready to record. So that means that these camcorders are pretty much the earliest ones in history where it made sense to review your footage right after you shot it. The thing that we now call chimping with digital SLRs. So that's a big feature bump compared to videotape but a big glaring feature gap compared to videotape is that you can't record over anything. We'll get into more of this later, but generally speaking, you can't delete a video once it's on the disc. This gets particularly exciting because the earlier ones do not support DVD RW. I'm not sure why. The format was around at the time these came out, but they'll only do R or DVD RAM. This means once you've shot a video, you're stuck with it. And that kind of highlights a primary downside of this media you aren't able to just freely write and remove data from it. So if you had a DVD-R, once you record it, it's done. You've got whatever's on there, you can never reuse it again. And with a DVD-RW, once those became available in camcorders, you could reuse it, but you had to wipe the whole thing. You couldn't just delete one clip. That's not super ideal. So in terms of flexibility, discs at this point were actually less convenient than videotape was. However, I'm not convinced this actually bothered anybody. A lot of people used tapes by recording one, putting it in a box, recording another, putting it in a box, and then buying more tapes when they were out. And the people who wanted to reuse their media, well, they had to wait till DVD RW, but at that point, erasing a whole disc probably wasn't that big a deal because who starts recording over a tape when they want to save certain parts of it? Most people probably are okay with losing the whole thing at that point. So I'm not sure this was actually that big of a deal, but it is a weird thing to get used to. Now, reviewing footage in the field is a neat trick, but certainly not the primary purpose of these. What was it like to watch the video at home when you were done? Well, that's kind of why I made this video. Uh, if these just shot video and made discs and that was all there was to it, I don't think I could have come up with a narrative. The things that make us interested in old stuff are usually their flaws. These have flaws. The previous couple generations of camcorders made video you could only play out of the camcorder by plugging it into your TV. Now you can do that with these, they all have AV out, but why can't we just take the DVD out and play that in the TV? Isn't that the bridge we were sold? The ads and manuals for these camcorders do make this promise. They offer to return you to the halcyon days of VHS when you could take a tape straight out of the camcorder, put it into your VCR and play it, just like a rented movie. To the extent that this works, it works very well. There are limitations. Let's start with uh, the good foot forward. I'm gonna shoot video on this camcorder and go put it into my girlfriend's set top player and we'll see how that looks. This is being played like any normal commercial DVD, and as you can see, the camcorder created a menu with individual thumbnails for each of the clips that I recorded. Since it makes a new clip every time you press the button, if you think about it while you're recording and you make sure you create clips only for things that are interesting, assuming you know what's coming up in the event that you're recording, you can make a disc that actually will let you navigate via thumbnail so you can look for interesting events and choose them from your DVD remote. Given a fairly determined user who's willing to work within the constraints of the camera and its medium, this thing is a design triumph because it turns a person who knows nothing about video editing and would normally have produced a videotape with you know two hours of content and no way to find anything interesting 
into somebody who can produce a finished, polished work that you can put into anyone's DVD player. You don't have to dangle a camera off their TV with a cord and just sit back on the couch and select the most interesting moments from a party or a soccer game or whatever else people record with camcorders without any effort at all. That's pretty cool. When this system works, it works very well. The problem is that authoring DVDs is not as simple as recording videotape. With tape, you start recording by doing it, uh, and you stop recording by not doing it anymore. With DVD, it is somewhat more involved than that. The DVD camcorder is meant to look that simple, and the manufacturers really tried, but under the hood, DVD is really sophisticated, and they were not able to hide all that sophistication from the user. The video I just shot on this disc, if I put it in my PC, there'll be no files. If I take it upstairs, put it in my girlfriend's DVD player, it'll say the disc is blank. That's because writable optical media is incredibly janky. Even if you're pretty young, you're probably familiar with quite a few writable media formats. CDR, CDRW, DVDR, DVDRW, DVD plus R, DVD plus RW, DVRAM, BDR, BDRE, dual sided discs, dual layer discs, MO. I could go on, but those are all the successful ones. Generally speaking, the ones with an R in the name you can put in your burner and write to one time. The other ones you can erase and write to again. But with all these formats, you don't have to write to the entire disk at once. You can write a little bit of data, and then you can write more data later. But it's not as simple as that. I researched how optical disks worked for so long that I had like 20 minutes of exposition here. And when I came back and read it, I was just speaking in tongues. So let me go with the brass tacks. Before you can read almost any burned disk, you have to finalize it. Finalizing a disk is a process in which the burner writes some special information that's necessary for other drives to find the data you just read. Once you've finalized a disk, you can read it in almost any drive, at least nowadays. But as the name implies, you can't write any more data to it. This finalization thing was present in almost every disk format, and it put camcorder designers in a real pickle. If you want to record video to a disk, it can't be finalized. But if you want to play the disk, it has to be finalized. So how do you record video, then play it back, then record more video? You can't. If you have a DVD-R and you put that in your camcorder and record five minutes of video on it and you want to go see it immediately, you have to finalize it. And once you've done that, you have a five minute disk. Doesn't matter how long it was before. Now it's a five minute disk. If it's a DVD-R, that's it. The rest is just gone. If it's a DVD-RW, you can either wipe the disc, like we said before, you have to erase everything at once, or on some camcorders, you can unfinalize it. I don't know what this is. Um, I read a whole bunch of like patents and stuff and could not figure out what unfinalizing does or whether it's actually supposed to work. So I don't know if it breaks compatibility with any DVD players, but at least there is that option if your camcorder can do it. Again, that wasn't there in the first few years of DVD camcorders. It's super ironic that with all the benefits of random access memory, that this actually takes away the whole ability to flexibly use the media the way you could with videotape. Of course, you could still plug your camcorder into a TV and play your video back without finalizing. Which brings us to an interesting question. As I showed you earlier, I can record a clip on this and then press the play button and immediately watch the clip. No finalizing. So the camcorder could read it without finalization. Why can't other things? I looked up all the documentation I could. I even read some patents and I couldn't find anything that explained how this trick was accomplished. But if this camera can do it, if all these cameras can do it, why couldn't players do it? Why can't my PC do it? If you don't need the finalizing to read the disc, then can't we just not finalize and say we did? The whole thing seems dumb and inexplicable, and I can't figure out why any of it was needed or why it never got fixed. Now, the best part of all is that the decision of when to finalize is on you by necessity. The camcorder can't know when you're done shooting and are ready to ruin the rest of your disc. So you have to make the decision of when to lock that disc down. It's also not obvious how to do this. Even if you're told, oh, you have to finalize the disc, you have to dig into the menus and start going through them to find the option for it. There's no button on the camera that does it, and it's never on the first page of the menu when you open it. Even if you filled up the entire disc and there are no other options for proceeding, it will still require you to go into the menu and find the finalize option and then select, yes, I definitely want to do this. There's nothing else you can do, and it still requires you to do this. It's a UX disaster. I can only imagine the hell of your parents calling you over and over, telling you that they shot video at their niece's birthday party or whatever, and they can't read it and the disc is ruined and you're going, you have to finalize it, mom. Like I told you last time, 
and then you're trying to walk them through finding the option in the menus because you only vaguely remember where it is. And every time they try to go right on the menu, it doesn't respond immediately because the camera has a slow processor. So they hit it again and it buffers the input and they end up two menus over and they're just freaking out. They're just losing it. Like, I think the video is gone. And you're like, no, no. And all of this is not their fault because this is a weird thing to have to do. It's a weird thing to be told you have to do this and to learn when you should do this and when you shouldn't do this and what the drawbacks are. And it's just ridiculous they weren't able to insulate the user from this in any way. This sucks, but it also seems to be an inevitable quality of the medium. These discs just are based on technology that wasn't for this. They weren't designed from the ground up to do this thing, and they're being beaten into shape, and they don't quite fit. I have to assume this whole finalization nonsense was really irritating to consumers, caused all sorts of confusion, and probably led to some really weird behavior. You know like how people will just leave their dishes dirty for like a whole day because the dishwasher isn't quite full and they don't want to run a load that's not full? There had to have been people walking around in June with Christmas footage on their camcorder because, hey, I've got 10 minutes left. I don't want to waste 10 minutes. Speaking of wasted minutes, let's talk about how long it takes to finalize a disc. On a PC, finalizing a disc takes, I don't know, 10 seconds? I don't think I've ever seen it take any longer. On these camcorders, it takes longer. For reasons I can't begin to comprehend, finalizing a disc in these camcorders seems to require writing to the entire surface of the disc at what appears to be worse than real-time speed. So per the manual, in the worst case scenario, finalizing a disc can take 35 minutes. I did not think this could be true when I read it. I, I just thought, no, that's some sort of like, that's some outlandish, like, oh, if the disc has errors, maybe it's got dirt on it or something, they're, they're preparing for rewrites, right? I set up my camcorder, I shot a couple minutes of video, and I went to finalize it. And honest to God, it said it would take approximately 33 minutes. I guess it must just be burning empty data to the entire surface of the disc. I don't know what it could be doing. Even better, in later years, dual layer DVD-Rs were introduced. And the worst case finalization time for those appears to be two hours. Yowza! <laughs> That's terrible. Uh, the saving grace is that the wait time goes down as you fill up the disc. So you really only hit those ridiculous finalization times if you just barely use a disc. If you fill the whole thing up, like probably a lot of people did, it only takes a few seconds. So that makes it better, but not great. Also, you can't finalize unless you're on AC power. It won't do it if it's on a battery. It's great that Hitachi realized this because who would bother to check the battery before starting a finalize? I wouldn't, I would never remember to do that. But if you're at a friend's house and all you have is a sack of spare batteries and you didn't bring along the really cumbersome AC adapter, you're out of luck. Let me explain what I mean by the cumbersome AC adapter. With camcorders, very rarely, you'll get one that's like this, where it just has a DC plug. Very simple, straightforward, I love it. That's not how most camcorders work. Most camcorders are powered by something like this. See, take the battery off the camera, and then you've got this plastic plate here, and the plate has contacts on it. They're in the same pattern as the battery. And you take that plate and you put it on the back of the camera where the battery would go. These are called battery replacers. Uh, I hate that term. Since it's meant to feel and look like a battery but isn't a battery, I call these battery dildos. Then you take that and you plug it with a proprietary connector usually into your battery charger. So now you've got this janky multi-cord thing with this weak connection in the middle of it. And you can't even charge a battery on here while you're running the camcorder. These things are terrible when they're new, but in addition, they're almost all gone. Every time somebody gets a used camcorder, this thing has been lost or they just throw it away and then put just the camcorder up on eBay. Which means that once this battery dies, if I can't buy a new one, this camcorder turns into a pumpkin. Same with all the other ones. Now that's a nerd nitpick. It probably didn't bother that many consumers, but the preceding 15 minutes were a dumpster fire of user experience disasters. I just explained a whole bunch of things about these camcorders that you shouldn't need to know. And I think this is veering us towards some reasons these might not be as fondly remembered as other types of camcorder. I'm not saying they failed. I think a lot of people will say something failed when they didn't have one or like 80% of houses didn't have one. And that's a metric that should only matter to CEOs. If you're a CEO, I don't care what you think. There were so many DVD camcorders sold for so long that by the only metrics that matter, these things must have been successful, but I suspect they were not loved. 
I think people had these, and I think people used them, but I don't think they felt the kind of attachment that they did to VHS camcorders, where they were just kind of married to them. I think they must have been a little less transparent than people would have preferred, and a lot less transparent than the modern SD card type ones, which you just use until it says card full, and there's literally nothing else to think about. And if you're not convinced, then I gotta tell you about some of the other limitations of the format. The finalization thing is weird, but like nerds could probably figure it out. There are plenty of things about these that most nerds probably can't figure out, including me. Bob Kelso. For instance, uh, many camcorders allowed you to record in two different modes, DVD video or DVD VR. These both record the same type of footage, but they record it in different formats on the disc. The DVD video format is the one that'll play in any consumer DVD player. VR is intended specifically for DVD recorders, so not just camcorders, but like dedicated standalone units. I don't know what those were used for or who bought them. I guess you could use them for like DVR purposes or something. Uh, but the advantage of those is that uh, somehow they allow you to delete and trim clips on like a DVD RW without having to wipe the entire disc. Don't know how and not very relevant to most consumers, but a lot of these camcorders would make you make the decision of which mode to use, having no idea what the other one was for. Another thing is the weird mess of DVD versus DVD plus. There are other people who can explain this better than me, but I have to put a disclaimer here. A lot of the issues I've described so far and some more issues I'll describe later might go away if you use plus R or plus RW media. I'm gonna cop out here and say, I couldn't make sense of it, which means most consumers couldn't make sense of it and most consumers probably bought whatever was cheapest or most available. So you have to assume that the minus R, the lowest common denominator, was what most people perceived these as. So I'm just gonna go with that. Besides, the early models didn't support those formats anyway. So given that most consumers probably didn't understand that DVD R and plus R were different formats, imagine the experience of flipping through the manual and seeing the tables that explain what you can and can't do depending on which format you have. I've stared at these and I can't make any sense of it. I don't know which one is the best disc or if you just have to have different ones for different purposes. And I'm highly technical. Imagine what it's like for someone who's not. They have more tables and even flow charts. It's just baffling. And some of it doesn't make any sense even having tried it. There's spots in the flow chart where I swear it said that if you unfinalize a disc, it'll delete the disc menu. But then I tried that and it just made a new one. So what does that mean? Does it break compatibility with something? I have no idea. It's all very spooky. I don't like it. The whole experience is just intimidating. Even if you don't care about any of that though, you just want to slam a disc in the device, leave it on defaults and hit record, you still run into the runtime issues. The original highly successful portable video format was VHSC. It only got 30 minutes per tape, which was pretty painful. Nobody liked that. But by the end of the 80s, they'd mitigated this. You could record in like EP mode, which would get you, I think, an hour, two hours of video on one of these little tapes. You had to decrease the quality to do that. EP didn't look as good. But then when you got to Hi8 tape and you got to mini DV tape, it would let you do an hour in the highest quality mode. So things had gotten a lot better. Then DVD comes along. Knocks us right back to 30 minutes. The original 1.4 gig 8 centimeter DVD R can only store 30 minutes of video. Eventually, they did put out dual layer DVD Rs, which got us back up to 60 minutes, but they came in late and they cost more. There were also dual sided DVD Rs, but you had to flip those halfway through, so you might as well have just brought two discs with you, really. But just like your videotape formats, you could extend your runtime on DVDs by lowering your quality level. Did you know that DVDs supported lower bit rates and lower resolutions? I had no idea until I read it off the back of a box of DVDs I bought. This camera here supports three modes, extra, fine, and standard. Here, I'm shooting at the maximum eight megabit quality level. Here, I'm shooting at the median six megabit quality level. And this is the minimum three megabit quality level. Now, when I tested this beforehand, it looked pretty good to me. And I think to a lot of people, this would look fine. In this mode, you can get 60 minutes of video onto a single-sided DVD-R. And if you got a dual-sided or a dual-layer one, you could get up to two hours of video. Getting two hours of video onto a single disc in 2004 was pretty cool. But again, you had to know this was there and what the trade-offs were. So most people probably never used it. By the way, the resolution of these modes is interesting. The 2010 DVD camcorder shoots at the full 720x480 DVD resolution, but the 2004 model never does. Its higher two quality tiers shoot at 702x480 
and the lowest quality mode shoots at 352 by 480. Now these numbers are all weird, I don't know where they come from, but they are part of the DVD specification, apparently. The third one, however, is interesting, because it's actually taller than it is wide, so it's shooting in portrait mode and then stretching to landscape. Now, there's lots of video formats that will throw away some horizontal resolution to save space because we don't notice horizontal resolution, but I've never seen one that was actually being shot in the opposite aspect ratio from how it'll be displayed. If all goes well, I'll put a video clip up here showing what it looks like if you don't stretch it, and in my head, it's pretty wacky. All right, so DVD camcorders were a mess. Uh, they were quirky, you had to be savvy to know how to operate them effectively, they probably confused a lot of people, but ultimately they mostly worked. I mean, by and large, this thing has done whatever I asked it to do, except for these couple weird things you have to know about. Uh, in addition, if you're wondering how they deal with shake, I haven't had a problem so far with recording video while I'm moving the camera around. Um, while it was recording the last clip, I was unscrewing it from the tripod and nothing happened. So they seem to be fairly robust, but they're just weird. The thing is, if you were savvy, if you were a huge nerd at this time, there's a good chance that you weren't so interested in getting video into a normal DVD player. You were probably, by 2004, more interested in getting it into a computer. Well, if you're doing that, you can actually use these in a much better mode. Now we get to talk about DVD RAM. You might not know that DVD RAM discs existed. Um, I think they missed most people, and I'm not sure why. It was a pretty cool technology. Uh, it came out in the late 90s along with DVD, and it provided a much better format for like most of what nerds do. If this was a video about DVD RAM, I'd go do deep background and figure out what the whole story with it was. It's not, so I'm just gonna say that I would think it would have been a like indelible cultural artifact, something that everyone remembers using and loves, but almost nobody seems to remember using it, and I have no idea why. I mentioned earlier that DVD RWs cannot be erased. Uh, if you put a file on one, it's just there until you delete the entire disk. This isn't 100% true. If you had, for instance, a Windows XP machine, uh, you could put a disk in it and just delete a file off of it and the file would disappear and then you could put it in another computer and it would still be gone. You could overwrite it and it would get overwritten. But this was only enabled by a trick. It was all illusions. DVDs and Blu-rays actually, use a file system called UDF that is specifically designed to enable tricks like this. Long story short, when you delete a file off of one of these disks on your PC, it just marks the file as not existing. It's still there on the disk, you just can't see it. If you overwrite a file, the old version is still there, it just burns a new version and only links to that one. Because it's all an illusion though, as you overwrite or delete files, the disk will get smaller and smaller as it fills up with old versions. If it's a DVD-R, it'll eventually just be impossible to write anything else to it. And if it's an RW, you'll have to erase it before you can use it again. So this is a cute trick, but it doesn't actually solve the problem that people wanted to use disks like flash drives. DVD-RAM can be used just like a flash drive. I need a laptop. I'm gonna put this DVD-RAM disk in the drive. It shows up just like any other DVD, but if I select it, I can then grab a file and drag it onto the disk. It starts copying onto the disk just like it's a USB flash drive. I mean, it's not copying very fast. It's about uh, 900 kilobytes per second, which is not hot, but I didn't have to use a burning program. There's no sessions, there's no finalization. When it's done, it'll just be done. I should mention this is not a special drive. It's a completely bog standard DVD burner from a 2011 Dell business laptop. If you have a DVD burner or a Blu-ray burner, it'll almost certainly do this too. And then once it's on there, I can just delete it and now the file is gone. I mean, the bits are probably still on the disk, but they're no longer marked as being used. So when I go to put another file on there, it'll overwrite them. These came out about when DVD did, and I don't know why they didn't have massive uptake, because they pretty much do just what flash drives do. For all intents and purposes, they're just slow USB drives. I think these were intended to be a replacement for Magneto Optical in professional use, but they could have been used by anyone, and indeed, anyone buying one of these camcorders could use DVD RAM in it. The disc I have in this camcorder right now is DVD-RAM. Let me show it to you. You can tell it's DVD-RAM because it's got these weird little dash marks on it. My understanding is that those are called hard sectors. They basically delineate the beginning and end of chunks of data on the disc so that when the laser goes to do a read or write operation, it can precisely locate a specific spot. This allows it to erase just one chunk of data and rewrite it. As far as I understand it, these are really no different than DVD RWs. They just provide extra location info, which allows the drive to precisely target a piece of data and overwrite or delete it. This fundamentally alters how the medium works, and now you can just freely delete and overwrite data. 
So that means we can do this. Hi there, it's me, here I am. I'm gonna take the disc out of this camcorder, put it right into this computer, the thing I told you you couldn't do. Now if I go into the disc here and drag this file onto VLC. Hi there, it's me, here I am. There I am. So that's really cool. Why would you ever use DVD-R or DVD-RW? It's because they don't read on normal players. Of course they don't. We can't have nice things. I don't know why DVD-RAM was not supported on most players. There were some that could do it, but my understanding is many wouldn't, so this was pretty much dead on the vine. It was never going to go anywhere as far as consumers were concerned, because at that point, very few people wanted to put videos onto their computer. For that purpose, it works fantastically, and I think you could also put these discs into the aforementioned commercial DVD recorders and they would play, but for the vast majority of people, this was completely irrelevant. But if you were one of the people that this was applicable to, it was awesome. Everybody else was using their mini DV cameras, sitting around waiting for the data to spool off. You were coming home after shooting some video, plunking this thing in your computer like an SD card and just copying the files off. DVD RAM is unquestionably very cool. And when you add it to one of these camcorders, it fixes all the problems. All the finalization nonsense goes out the window. Having to care what type of disc you're using goes out the window. It's pretty much a modern flash camcorder, except it's using a little bit slower medium. It functions exactly the same as my Canon Vixia in every conceivable way. In the late 2000s, as broadband proliferated and people started getting computers and large hard drives and whatnot, this could have started becoming a lot more relevant as people wanted to get more video onto their computers and share it online and so on. However, flash drives were coming down in price, hard drive camcorders were coming out, so DVD-RAM never had an opportunity to shine the way it could have. But man, I wish I'd had one of these back in the day. I would have loved it. All right, I have to eat crow here. It appears I was a little too hard on Caddy. When I was editing this video, I had to get the footage off the DVD RAM discs that I shot in the camcorders. I discovered that no matter how careful you are, you will fingerprint them. And if you fingerprint them, they will not read. No matter how small the smudge is, the drive just spits them back out. So it appears that the caddy was absolutely necessary. And this just makes Hitachi's decision to put it in a camcorder when there was no other equipment to take it even wilder, but I, I guess there were just no options. I mean, Hitachi could have put out a PC drive that supported the smaller cartridges, but I can't find evidence that they or anyone else did this. So again, the 2000s were a wild time to be alive, and I apologize to DVD RAM caddy. I was mean to you. However, uh, despite the fact that hard drives and SD cards were very soon going to eclipse the need for any sort of physical media, disc-based camcorders didn't die there. The next model here is the Hitachi DZ BD10HA, again with the Hitachi. Uh, they were making optical drives and discs, so every time a new format came out, they were first to market with a bunch of stuff like this. This one's not much of a logical leap. I mean, it takes Blu-ray. Blu-ray had come out, it was the new video format. Obviously, there was going to be a Blu-ray camcorder, so here it is. Like the others, it shoots on an eight centimeter disc. Just this time, it's a Blu-ray. This is a BDRE. If you're curious about the difference between an RW and an RE, there is none. There was some sort of slap fight at the Blu-ray forum and they decided to change the terminology everyone was used to to one that didn't make any sense. In most functional senses, uh, this is indistinguishable from the DVD camcorders, uh, except that, of course, it shoots in HD. It shoots 1920 by 1080, interlaced, of course, but nobody got progressive HD in 2008. Nobody. Besides the jump to high def, all the positives and many of the negatives still apply. Uh, it shoots the same way, it auto-generates menus, you can play the discs in a set-top Blu-ray player. Uh, really the biggest change is just that this one only takes a few seconds to finalize the disc regardless of how much you record. It also gets about an hour of video on one disc at high bitrate, which is pretty cool, although high bitrate here doesn't seem to count for that much. Here's the BD-10 recording at 16 megabits. Here's the BD-10 recording at 8 megabits. And here it is shooting at 5 megabits. Now, to my eyes, none of these looked that great when I tested it. This one isn't even shooting in full resolution. It's shooting at 1440 by 1080, which is actually a 4.3 resolution, which is being stretched to 16.9, just like the DVD widescreen discs do. This was a pretty common thing for early camcorders shooting in HD to do 1440 by 1080. There's even some pro equipment that does it. It just saves a lot of space by throwing away some horizontal detail that most people will never notice. Now, as a convenient, easy to use, consumer affordable device that shoots on the same format that won the HD video war, this seems just as relevant as the DVD cameras, except that this is not actually shooting on Blu-ray. 
Yes, it shoots on Blu-ray if you want to do that, but it also has a built-in hard drive and it can shoot on SD card. That's where the video I just shot actually came from. I should mention that Hitachi actually made a ton of hybrid cameras like this throughout the late 2000s, uh, and their name for them in Japan was Woo. Not Woo, Woo. I'm not joking. When I was first looking this up on eBay, I kept seeing these things listed with Woo in quotes, and I thought it was some sort of like SEO search technique. No, that is really what they're called in Japan. I have no idea why. So you could switch between the three formats very easily by just flipping the switch at the back to switch between modes. And there's no difference in how it shoots video. Uh, I just used the SD card to shoot that because it's the exact same files that would be recorded to the Blu-ray disc. It's just a lot easier to get it into my computer. So it really just comes down to convenience. If you wanted long run time, you shot on the hard drive. If you wanted convenience, you shot on the SD card. And if you wanted something that would play in a set top player, you shot on the Blu-ray. For a ton of people, the Blu-ray capability of this would have been irrelevant. If you got this as a gift, or you got it because it was on sale or something, you could just totally ignore that part and just use it as a hybrid hard drive SD camera, and I'm sure that happened a lot. The people who would have been interested in the Blu-ray component would have been uh, people who weren't very computer savvy, so they still wanted discs they could play in their normal set-top box, or people who wanted to be able to burn discs to give to other people. Even if you did have your own high-end PC at this time, you couldn't rely on your family members having one, so if you wanted a video of your kid's first steps that you wanted to take around to the family, you could burn a disc and take it around and play it in their players. And the great part about this is you didn't even have to burn it on the disc to begin with. There's this little button on here called dubbing, which will let you copy between any of the internal formats. So you can copy from hard drive to SD, from Blu-ray to hard drive, or from hard drive to Blu-ray you can master a disc right in the camcorder wherever you are. So you can just shoot everything on the hard drive, and then when you realize that someone might want a particular set of clips to watch on their TV, you can just select them, burn them to the disc, and give them the disc right there on the spot. Realizing this capability led me to this beautiful fantasy about a man who I hope exists. Imagine some dad, some gadget dad, you know the type, who goes to a soccer game for his kid, records it on his camcorder, and then at the end, as it's winding down, he sits there on the bleachers with a stack of mini discs, putting them into his camcorder and running off dub plates of the game. He sits there, burning these discs, putting them in little envelopes, sealing them with little stickers he printed on his inkjet printer with his Avery labels, and hands went out to every other parent. I'm sure this man existed, and I love him. This tremendous dork is my hero. Hyper nerds like me are so cynical that we won't use tools like this. It's not nearly cool and slick and correct enough. But this guy is living his best life somewhere, still running off Blu-rays on this camcorder that nobody watches. But he's really satisfied with how things are going, and I'm really happy for him. Ultimately, I think most people who got this camera never used the Blu-ray burner. I think they mostly got them as gifts. They got them because they were on sale, and the Blu-ray was this thing that was neat. It was a nice bullet point. They never ended up using it. And of course, if you ignore the disc burner, there is absolutely nothing that stands out about this camera, except that it was HD in 2008, which was still pretty cool at the time. There is one weird quirk about it, in case you ever have one, which is that the files it produces, no matter what medium you burn them on, they'll play in normal Blu-ray players. They will not play on a current computer. They should just be plain H.264, really the same thing that this camera's producing. But I put them into every program I had, VLC, MPC, AVI DMUX, every single program that I normally use to view or convert files just chokes on this. They play the audio, but no video. People have taken some stabs at trying to figure out what's wrong with it, and as best we can tell, it's just setting some flags incorrectly in the file that just confuses the hell out of FFmpeg. Adobe Premiere can read it, and the software that comes with the camera can sort of read it. Naturally, it came with a disc that had some bespoke Hitachi program, something they commissioned just for playing the Blu-ray files from this camera on computers of the era. Uh, but when you try and play the files out of this with it, it loads them in the wrong color space and with some sort of weird vertical striping phenomenon going on. But if you run it through the conversion utility that like converts it into MP4, it works. So I have no idea what's going on there. Anyway, that pretty much... Uh, sums up the timeline, right? I mean, that's the whole 2000s. You went from DVD to Blu-ray, so that's the end of the disc story. Well, not quite, because there's things that happened later for weird reasons, there's things that happened earlier that are worth talking about, and there's things that didn't happen that I want to cover. First, let's return to the 2010 DVD camera, the one that I've been lying to you about. What lies behind the tape? Let me firmly mire this thing in context. The Blu-ray format hit the market hard in 2006. The Blu-ray camcorder came out in 2008. Why would you put out a standard def camcorder in 2010? Well, I will now reveal the dark secrets of this device. 
This is the Sony HDR UX5, and it shoots in HD. No, it doesn't shoot on Blu-ray, and no, it doesn't shoot on HD DVD. That's a different format. They never made camcorders for that. I wish I would have one. No, this shoots in HD on DVDs. It shoots 1920 by 1080 interlaced video, just like the Blu-ray camera does. Uh, it just does it on DVD. You can't play these in a normal DVD player, of course, but because it shoots in AVC HD, which is basically the Blu-ray camcorder format, you can play these discs in Blu-ray players. Ah, I see I have a question. Uh, okay, I see the whole audience is asking the same question. Wouldn't that suck? Yeah, how are you gonna fit any substantial amount of 1080 video onto a DVD since they're so much smaller? That's a good question. I'm glad you asked that. You can't do it. The runtime on these is atrocious. For anyone who isn't following along at home with Wikipedia and a calculator, a normal Blu-ray disc is 25 gigs per layer. And at the normal commercial bit rate of Blu-ray movies, which is apparently 40 megabits per second, that's only about 135 minutes of video. On a 1.4 gig DVD, um, well, it's not great, it, it varies. You can shoot with different bit rates, but uh, at the full bit rate, you get uh, 15 minutes. 15 minutes is uh, not good, it's the other thing. Bad, that's it. Unusable, worthless product nobody would want. There it is. At 15 minutes, this would be completely unusable for anyone. That is a useless format. Nobody needs a camera that can only shoot 15 minutes per disc. Now, there are ways to mitigate this. If you put a dual layer disc in there, you get back up to 30 minutes which sucks because it's taking us back to, you know, 1984. But the other thing you can do is to lower the quality. This will go down to lower bit rates, just like all the others. Uh, at its lowest bit rate, it's five megabits, and it'll do 60 minutes at that bit rate. But the question is, do you want 60 minutes of five megabit video? Well, shockingly, yes, you would. It actually looks pretty good. In fact, it looks better than the Blu-ray camera. I figure, being a couple years newer, this one has better optics, a better sensor, a uh, faster image processor. It's probably getting a lot more out of these five megabits than the Blu-ray camera was. And since H.264 is so much more efficient than MPEG-2 was, it's getting a lot more out of the five megabits than it was as a DVD camera. So once you put this all together, this actually makes a ton of sense. This video wouldn't look half bad being played on a 42 inch plasma screen at a family gathering. And you can get 60 minutes on here on a cheap DVD-R instead of an expensive new Blu-ray disc. So this camera is actually really dope. And to be fair to the camera, if you do need to shoot something that's only gonna last a few minutes, shooting in the high quality modes, like this 12 megabit mode, which is the best this camera can do, does look fantastic. In addition, it's not a badly made product. In fact, it even has a full-size HDMI port, which none of my other cameras have, except the one I'm shooting this on, which I bought because it had a full-size HDMI port. The Blu-ray camera also has HDMI, but it's mini HDMI, which in my experience breaks really easily, so I detest it. This camera is so much better than it has any right to be that I'm actually thinking of using it as a second angle camera in future shoots. It's actually that good. As impressive an accomplishment as this is though, I think by 2010, people were probably getting very used to manipulating and sharing video on smartphones or on their computers. And so the need for physical media of this sort was probably declining rapidly. There were of course the family members who only had a Blu-ray player or a DVD player, but at this point, if you really needed to, you could put the video on your computer, convert it and burn it to a disc. So I suspect that this didn't have that much uptake. Um, they didn't make any more of them. The last DVD camcorder I'm aware of was in maybe 2011, and I can't quite pin down which one that would have been. And I don't know where Blu-ray camcorders went necessarily, but I think by and large, people don't care about disc media anymore. I think this is really where it ended. Going backwards in the timeline though, people might be wondering, were there ever any CD camcorders? Now, CD was never a video format for most people, but there was that thing called video CD, right? If you're from the US, there's probably like a 1% chance that you've heard of video CD, let alone seen one. It had no uptake here. It came out in like 1993. It was supposed to be, you know, a replacement for VHS, but it was really low quality and nobody wanted to buy a machine just to play video CD since it wasn't that much better than VHS. And so it just sort of died on the vine and nobody here bought it and it was very quickly forgotten. It was very limited since it was using MPEG-1, which had inferior compression to MPEG-2, and it was using a smaller disc to begin with, you could not get a whole movie onto a video CD in anything like full resolution. So it used the atrocious resolution of 352 by 240. That would look a little bit like this, which is not great. 
It's not completely awful. In a lot of ways, it's similar to the effective resolution of the original VHS before there were any enhancements, but I think nobody here was willing to upgrade just to get this. I know about Video CD primarily because in the late 90s it played a small role in the burgeoning movie piracy scene, where people were trying to get movies online that had been ripped from DVDs and play them on their TVs, but they didn't have any DVD burners. What you could do is you could transcode to the MPEG-1 format, burn it to a video CD, and most DVD players would play it. This was a ridiculous process that had all sorts of pitfalls, but hey, you wanted to watch The Matrix on your big screen and you didn't want to pay for it, what else were you going to do? So Video CD had very little penetration here, but it did take off in other regions, a number of Asian countries where ostensibly its resistance to humidity and its small size made it a lot more appealing than VHS. Wikipedia has a picture of a uh, store in the Philippines that's got like 2014 era movies racked up on the shelves in VCD format, and I've heard that it's actually still around now, though I can't confirm that. So in a place that loves VCD that much, you'd think there would have been a VCD camcorder from Hitachi, right? Usually when something like this exists, I can find some evidence of it, but if they made them, they never made them here, and they never made it to an English language website, but mostly I just think they never made them. Video CD does not lend itself well to camcorder use, since it uses the ISO 9660 file system instead of UDF like DVD and Blu-ray. This could have been overcome, but would have been a huge pain in the ass. Probably the bigger issue though is that CD burners were an exotic, highly expensive item until the late 90s, at which point DVD had come out. Why bother putting R&D into a portable CD burner in 1998 when the new dominant format is clearly going to be DVD? That's just speculation, but to the best of my knowledge, video CD camcorders never happened. That's not to say, however, there weren't cameras that took CDs. This here is a Mavica CD350. You've probably heard of Mavicas as the digital cameras that shoot photos on floppy disks, but this one takes CD. Sony made several models that took CDs and CDRWs. I actually have some official Mavica disks here, and boy howdy, are they ever aesthetic. I had a CD500, which was a much cooler model that I wanted to show to you, uh, but it didn't work, and foolishly, I took it apart trying to repair it, uh, and that didn't go so well. So then I got this one and it also doesn't work, at which point I realized it was probably the media at fault because all discs from this era have rotted. Uh, so I really wish I hadn't destroyed my CD500. But of course these cameras aren't really intended for shooting video. They're just like modern still digital cameras that have a video mode where you can shoot clips of you know short lengths, sometimes slightly longer lengths, but they're, they're just an extra feature. It's not meant to be a video camera. This one can shoot 640 by 480 for about five minutes before it fills up the disc. Uh, if you want to get longer runtime, you can go to a lower resolution. I don't know the exact resolution, but I believe it's 160 by 120. Now I can't get this to record video, but I think that would look just about like this. I'm not sure you'd ever want to shoot video like this. Yeah, you get a longer runtime, but what are you gonna do with it? Also, it does not produce video CDs. Instead of recording ISO 9660, this shoots normal AVI files in the UDF file system. So you can read them on a computer, but as far as I know, there is no box you can put this in that will play the video on a TV. In conclusion, there are not really any CD camcorders. There was, however, one more consumer disc camcorder that made it to market. Barely, but it did make it. There was one model of mini disc camcorder, the Sony DCM M1. Sony didn't make any others. They did make enough of these that they do show up on eBay, although they command kingly prices because mini disc is a collecting meme, so I didn't get one, but they did exist. They sucked. They could only shoot maybe 20 minutes of video at the lowest resolution. I don't have any specs on that, but it was probably terrible. The only thing you could really do with it was put it into your PC. I didn't find any evidence that they made any set-top video players. So I don't think anybody really wanted this thing, and that's probably why Sony didn't make any more of them. However, it did come out in 1999, which predates both the CD Mavica and in fact the first DVD camcorder. So this was the first consumer device I'm aware of that could shoot video on disc at all. It wasn't good, and I don't know much else about it, and that just about wraps up our timeline for consumers. You could speculate that the broadcast market looked at all this stuff and just went, nah, that's that's too consumery, that's trash. And as far as I can tell, this does seem to be true. I was only able to find one single professional camcorder that made it to market using a consumer disc format. 
Although the advantages of disc media really seem appealing to the pro market, and I'm sure they were, the downsides of these media were really intense. I mean, you couldn't go out and shoot video of a train derailment and then go back to the studio and have to sit there for 25 minutes while your camera finalized the disc. You would throw that camera away. Pros also need high quality. At this time, pro video was being shot at between 18 to 25 megabits. I did the math, and that would fill up a mini DVD in about 8 minutes. A dual layer could get you up to about 15 minutes, but that's still not good enough. In addition, these formats can't be knocked around the way that videotapes can, since none of them come in caddies except for DVD RAM. With that said, DVD RAM really does seem like it fixes all the problems. It seems like a super rad pro format. It's fully encapsulated, so it can't get scratched, it can't get dirt on it. You can just throw a bunch of these in your bag and not worry about them. It's got the necessary runtime if you use the full size discs, which pro cameras are big enough to accommodate. It seems like a slam dunk. I've had this weirdly clear memory of a professional camcorder that took a full-size 12 centimeter DVD. You could see it spinning back here while you were shooting, but I've looked and looked and looked and I must have made the memory up. The only pro disc camcorders I was able to find were the NEC disc cam, which never made it to market, and then Hitachi did put out one camera that took mini DVD RAM, and it was called the CRD10. Hey, that's me. It came out in 2003. Uh, the pamphlet boasts all the advantages you'd expect from disc media, uh, and it took DVD RAM in the original permanent cartridge, but it takes mini DVD RAM, and I can't make any sense of that. Professional camcorders are big enough, they could have just put the full-size disc in there. I can't fathom why they didn't. Maybe they just wanted to reuse the same mechanism they put in this thing? Ugh, that's sad to think about. I can't find any mention of these in magazines, and I figure probably nobody bought them, not just because mini DVD RAM was not a great format for pros given its runtime, but because at that point it had already been superseded in the pro market. In 2003, Sony entered the disc-based camcorder market with a format you've almost certainly never heard of. <clears throat> This is a Sony XD Cam PDW F335. It's from 2006, but it uses the same medium they released three years earlier, and that is this. This here is Sony Professional Disc, and I'm gonna cut right to the chase, it's Blu-ray. When I say that, I need you to both uh, believe me and take it with a grain of salt. Uh, I can't quite prove this, but let me give you the facts. Blu-ray was already in development by the year 2000. Sony was on the Blu-ray forum. The specifications of professional disc are nearly identical to early draft Blu-ray. And most importantly, this caddy, there it is again, the goddamn caddy, is identical to the ones seen in pre-release versions of Blu-ray. Yes, the Blu-ray forum tried to saddle us all with caddies again. Basically, although nobody can quite prove it, it sure looks like Sony siphoned off an early draft version of Blu-ray because they were impatient to get a professional video format to market first, went off on their own, developed it into this thing, and sold it as an incompatible format. It's kind of like how we got Wi-Fi Draft N because nobody was willing to wait for the spec to be finalized, except unlike Draft Wi-Fi, this one actually got finished, got ratified, and was used for many years because it was up to the specifications that professionals needed. Just like every other attempt to saddle the public with caddies, it would have been ridiculous to retain these on consumer Blu-rays. But for the pro market, they're perfect. Pros are really hard on their stuff, and they have the money and the space for a more durable medium. The fact that you could drop this, and it was completely sealed, makes this really appealing. If you take a look back at DVD RAM, you can actually mess DVD RAM up by accident. If you're holding it, and you're hand slides like this, whoops, you can fingerprint the surface of the disc. Beats the hell out of a bare disc, but it's still not completely safe. This one, on the other hand, cannot be opened unless you use a tool to press on this little release here. And then you have to very carefully slide these doors apart. You can't do it by accident. Professional Disc, or PFD, was basically indestructible, which is great because if you're a pro and you're swapping discs in and out of your camera rapidly and you drop one, you don't want it to get mud in it. And this wasn't a problem the way that it was for the consumer market because Sony made all sorts of equipment that took the PFD in the whole sandwich. Do you take your discs with or without the crust? What you just saw was actually footage from me taking one of these apart so I can try and read it in a modern Blu-ray drive just to see if it'll work. It didn't. Somebody suggested I try one of the drives that's capable of ripping PS3 games, since apparently those are also not quite Blu-rays, but I didn't want to get into all that, especially because I'm certain that Sony made changes to this format. I don't think it's truly Blu-ray. As far as I can tell, they never made a PFDR. They're all rewritable, and that makes perfect sense, but what's odd about them is, as far as I can tell, 
they don't work like RW disks. You don't have to erase the whole disk at once. It seems like when you delete a file off of this, it actually does delete it like it would with DVD RAM. Well, Blu-ray, as far as I know, is not capable of that, unless I completely missed something. If I did, I'm sure I'll find out in the comments. So Sony must have changed something that would have broken compatibility with normal Blu-ray in order to make it possible to precisely locate a spot on the disk. But I'll never know what because it's a proprietary format with no documentation. This does mean that there is no finalization process. Thank God. Regardless of how they did it, the fact remains that this removes the last few possible drawbacks of disk media. Since you don't have to finalize and there's no silly restrictions on erasing, you can use this thing just like an enormous flash drive. So the pro market was happy to snap these up, especially because they were really inexpensive. Although conversely, if you wanted to read one in your computer, the only way to do it was to get a USB drive, which Sony sold for kingly prices. But it's the pro market, so who cares? Work buys it for you. So yeah, 23 gigs, not 25. That is the same size as early Blu-ray before they finalized the format. That's big enough for two hours of footage at 25 megabits, uh, which is more than enough for pro use. It beat the hell out of the tapes they were using before this. And if you do manage to fill up the disc, you can swap discs in about five seconds. And apparently the camera will keep rolling through that swap process, so you won't lose anything. Now, PFD started out in the standard def years, but it continued being used well into the HD years. And in fact, this camcorder here is my only pro camera that'll do HD. Now, it is interlaced instead of progressive, and it is 1440 instead of 1920. But again, at this time, it was very hard to get 1920 by 1080 progressive. Nobody had it. It does look pretty good at this resolution. 1440 is fairly defensible. Here, let's check that out. This is what it looks like, and frankly, if it looks as good as my test footage, it looks so good I could probably mix this video into my normal shoots and you'd never notice it. In fact, I did that in this video. Every single close-up, like this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one, was shot on this camera. It honestly looks a lot better than I expected for 2006. I mean, this is a pro camera, so despite not being the top of the line, it was probably getting a better sensor than any consumer device, but I'm still pretty impressed. The only thing that really marks this as being dated is that it has no digital video output. With modern cameras, you of course expect HDMI, and with pro cameras, you expect HD-SDI. Now, there was a sub-model of this, the uh, PDW-F350, which did have HD-SDI. I thought I was buying that when I got this, so I was a little disappointed. What I got instead was the one that does component HD at probably 1035i, because this thing is from the in-between era when not everything was going to be digital, so they made an analog version despite it being a horrifying monstrosity. This sucks for me, because if the disc mechanism in here ever stops working, this thing will turn into a pumpkin, since there's no way to get quality video out of it. But that's my problem. Fortunately, the disc mechanism has not yet broken. Uh, it is still working. I shot a whole bunch of clips from this video on it, and it works pretty much like all my other pro cameras in every other regard. Just like my P2 camera, I can open the little door here and hit the thumbnail. Shows me all the files that are on there. I can play them back or delete them or whatever. But comparing it to the P2 camera raises some really interesting questions. Panasonic and Sony put out these two formats at the same time, uh, 2003 and 2004, respectively. Now, I did a video on the P2 camera before where I talked about how the flashcards for it were ungodly expensive, incredibly expensive. The smallest P2 card you could buy was like one or two gigs and cost like $1,200. But as far as I can tell, one of these PFDs was 23 gigs and like 50 bucks. It's so much bigger and I can't see any drawbacks to it. I mean, it's recording the same footage. I don't get why you would spend $2,400 on a Panasonic P2 card that was like a third the size of this. It took like eight years for P2 to catch up with the capacity on this stuff. And I don't really get why they were still selling them that whole time. Who was buying them? If your option was to get one of these, I'm just not seeing where the plus comes in. Like P2 had that clever trick where you could put multiple cards in one camera and then it would record from one to the next to the next. You could swap them out while you were recording. But I think that's mostly because P2 was so small, you had to do that. A fully decked out P2 camera with the largest cards available at the time was still like a quarter the size of one of these. I don't get it, and apparently a lot of other people didn't either because PFD was very successful as far as I can tell. Uh, they made multi-layer versions, they kept selling these well up into the late HD era. Uh, they didn't ever make it to 4K though. As far as I can tell, that's where the disc story ends. The era of the disc camera appears to be over, and of course, good riddance to it, right? No one ever wanted these. People knew a hundred years ago that someday we would have this, a box where you could just press a button and it would enshrine in high fidelity the warmth and vibrance of life and you could return to it anytime you wanted. They didn't know how it would be done, but they knew it was coming. 
We don't like sitting around waiting for technology to get good enough to do what we want to do. We're very good at looking forward to the future and saying, someday we'll do it this way. And I want it now. The 90s and 2000s were a fascinating time when companies were trying to make stuff they knew would exist now, but they didn't yet have the technology. They were trying to make iPods before there were small enough hard drives. They were trying to make smartphones before there were fast enough wireless internet connections and fast enough processors. And the results are like Doc Brown building a refrigerator in the 19th century. We watch all these YouTube videos about gadgets that were obviously ridiculous. They could not have done what they were trying to do. And we laugh at them. We say, why did they attempt to make this thing when obviously it wasn't possible yet? And the answer is they knew what was coming and they didn't want to wait. And who can blame them? If you enjoyed this, consider subscribing so I know you like this sort of thing. If you really enjoyed this, consider supporting me on Patreon because I spent way more on these than I'd like to admit. For those who are already supporting me, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I literally couldn't do this without you, particularly those in my higher Patreon tiers. I would love to shout you out, but that's getting logistically complicated. I'll tell you about it on the Patreon. Here's some people who have been supporting me, however. I'll probably keep doing that. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. And everybody else, thanks for watching. This is me on the internet. I am recording video. Video on the internet.